This is Chris Stapleton, and as of 2023, he is Country Music Hall of Fame eligible. And I know that's mind-blowing, because you probably figured he wouldn't be eligible until like 2035. That'd be 20 years after he blew up with Tennessee Whiskey at the CMA Awards. You're a sweet strawberry wine. But this episode of Secret History of Country Music is gonna prove is Chris achieved the needed level of national prominence much, much earlier than that. But one night at the CMAs and everything that came after reset his clock in a way that's frankly not fair. Brad Paisley's 2003 Mud on the Tire album was his breakthrough record, the one that really transformed him into a superstar. You'll find the title track on there, of course, as well as hits like Celebrity, Little Moments, and Whiskey Lullaby. Like the burning end of a midnight cigarette. You'll also find what, as far as we can tell, is Chris Stapleton's earliest cut on a major label album and the beginning of a trend that's defined country music for nearly two decades. When stars are born, the bearded one is often right there with him or her. It happened with Brad and Blake Shelton, Josh Turner and Thomas Rhett. When Darius Rucker transitioned from rock to country, he led with a Chris Stapleton song. When Luke Bryant needed to show some depth to solidify him as a multifaceted performer, he called on Stapleton's Drink a Beer. But Brad was first. Or at least Brad was one of the first. I'm Billy Dukes with Taste of Country, and the song we're talking about is called The Best Thing I Had Going, a banjo-driven, yearning-for-love song that's playful and deep. Playful isn't exactly how you'd describe many Chris Stapleton songs today, but before the beard, he was kind of fun. Yeah, that's right. We said before the beard. Stay tuned, and let us know your favorite of his songs in the comments section below as you watch. Swing by Trace Adkins. Swing, bada, bada, swing, bada, bada, swing, bada, bada, swing. Ain't swing nothing but a love swing. thing by Daryl Worley are two examples. Later, Chris would get a little frisky with this number one hit for Kenny Chesney. Well, I'm what I am, and I'm what I'm not. And I'm sure happy with what I've got. And then again, on Something to Do with My Hands, Thomas Rhett's 2012 debut. So maybe I could stick them in your pocket. When TR would pivot in 2015 with funkier songs from his second album, you want to guess who was there? Yep, Chris Stapleton co-wrote Crash and Burn too. This, of course, is all before his moment with Justin Timberlake at the CMAs, and before he'd release his own album. Thumbs up this video if you consider the Traveler album to be an all-time great. You want more? For our friends at the boot, Blake Shelton has cut an astonishing six Stapleton co-writes, including two on his career-changing album, Red River Blue, an album that landed at number 61 on Taste of Country's list of the top 100 albums of the 2000s. None of those songs were singles, but it's at that time that he went from the funny guy who used to have a mullet to a TV star in a celebrity marriage who could only hit number one on radio charts. Here are a few more titles to Stapleton's credit while I talk at you about his impact on reality television. You remember that TV show Can You Duet? Steel Magnolia won in season two and dropped their debut single, Keep On Loving You. The top five hit was written by Christopher Elvin Stapleton. Yeah, that's Chris on the right there in the John Deere farmer's cap and the overalls. Can't unsee that, can ya? Here's another from the singer's Facebook page and one more from wife Morgan's Instagram. Whew. Tim McGraw, Alan Jackson, and George Strait were early believers, but Chris didn't hesitate to name his first big break, Josh Turner's Your Man from 2005. You lock the door and turn the lights down low. The sun is a in 2020, we asked Chris if it was kind of strange singing his song on American Idol. Yeah, you can add Scotty McCurry to the list of artists who broke using his music. Yeah, I mean, it's still weird. You know, it's still weird. You know, you walk in someplace and you're like, oh, what's that? You're, you know, you're, you're eating at, eating dinner somewhere and just like, oh, I'm, you know, playing guitar on that or whatever, you know, like it, it's still a weird thing. And add Darius Rucker, who went country in 2008 with a song called Don't Think I Don't Think About It that was not written by Chris Stapleton. Nope. Two years later, the song Comeback Song would go number one for Darius and Chris. However, his first country album was called Learn to Live, an album with four big old country hits. But it all kicked off with a soulful, banjo-led, rollicking album cut called Forever Road. Yep, Darius started his country career with a Chris Stapleton song, 
because that's just what you do. This has been another Secret History of Country Music video. I'm Chris Stapleton, and joining me now is Addison Hager to go deeper into this story and talk about Chris's songwriting and his Country Music Hall of Fame eligibility. Hey, Addison. Hey, Billy. Okay, where I first want to start with this is after watching that video, Chris Stapleton has written for so many people. He's, like, hit every single... Like, what has he not covered? I really don't know. Like, from the 2000s on, he has, like, he's written for Adele and Ed Sheeran. He has a Bruno Mars and a Justin Timberlake like, um, songwriting credit in the pop world. And, of course, in country, I mean, George Strait, uh, Brad Paisley, Luke Bryant, Miranda Lambert, Blake Shelton, Thomas Rhett. I mean, you could just go on and on. And the amazing thing is, is, like, like he, a lot of these are album cuts, but like they're the album cuts you kind of remember from the albums. Like an example is um, uh, Little Big Town's Front Porch Thing. It's mm. a great song. Total Bop. That's a Chris Stapleson song. Um, Diamonds Make Babies was a Dirk Bentley song from 2012. Great song. Never made the radio, but you remember it if you listen to that album. That's a Chris Stapleton song. It like, just kind of goes on and on where the best songs are Stapleton songs. Can you think of maybe the why? Like, I personally don't necessarily have a, you know, pinpoint of what makes his song so memorable. But do you feel like there's kind of a, you know, across the a kind of a maybe a theme? Well, I think the best country songwriters are always sort of like every every man's poets. Like there's yeah. a poetry element, but it's never too it's never too highfalutin or too fancy. Or they're not using 10 cent words all the time. Like you can really easily access what they're talking about and apply that to your life. Um, there's a little bit of a turn of phrase happening, but it's songs are never relying on sort of turn of phrase or pun or sort of double entendres. And, and I think that's what, what Stapleton does probably about as well as anybody, maybe since Chris Christopherson is, is someone who comes to mind, like he's just really good at telling the stories in a simple way. And, um, and obviously having some great melodies to go with it, but he's not necessarily the most melodic songwriter in the world. Yeah. Is there an artist equivalent to Chris Stapleton, maybe in generations past where they were as equally great of a songwriter as they were as a performer? Like they could really be on both sides of that fence. Well, a couple that come to mind would be like Willie Nelson. I mean, you have oh, to go back yeah. to him. He was a he was a pretty legendary songwriter before he kind of had his first break as an artist. And Patsy Cline's "Crazy" is an example of a hmm. a Willie Nelson song, right? Um, but then I just mentioned Chris Christopherson, and Chris Christopherson didn't have like an amazing like artist career where he had like hmm. twenty number one hits or anything like that. But he was a great performing artist, great tour, um, tour, and certainly blew up and became kind of a celebrity on the big screen as well. So he became really, really famous in that sense. I guess those two men come to mind, and maybe there are others. Um, as If I were to think of some of the female greats, I'd come up with a few. But I don't know how many there's been really since then. I know. Well, that's what I was trying to think. I genuinely cannot. I, I can think of definitely artists who write for other artists and vice versa, but, but no one who it's like, you have such a large catalog uh, of, of songs on both ends of an artist and a, a writer. I kind of wonder why that is. It seems like you're kind of one or the other. And I wonder if it's because maybe it's just more lucrative to be a songwriter nowadays. So mm -hmm. like if you're a great hit songwriter, that might be enough to sort of satisfy you. And you might not want to do all the things that re are required of an artist. Um, but yeah, I mean, I mean, Luke Combs certainly has his favorite songwriters. Hardy's sort of an artist that comes to mind. I mean, he doesn't have nearly as deep of a catalog and, and as much success as Chris Stapleton, but like, Perhaps he could get there at some point because he mm. has a ton of songwriting credits from Morgan Wallen, Florida Georgia Line, and all these artists. And now he's starting to find starting to find his own success as an artist. So maybe he's on that track. But gosh, it's hard to believe he's going to get to where Chris Stapleton is. What was that turning point of kind of coming into being an artist? Well, it really was the CMA Awards. Like I, I feel like we it, looking back on that story, it's easy to think we simplify it and boil it all down to that CMA awards performance when really there was, there's other things and he was sort yeah. of growing and building as an artist and it would have happened anyway. It would not have happened anyway. Like he had released that really? traveler album. No, no, for sure. I mean, he had the artist support, but he released that traveler album and, and, and it was critically acclaimed and people loved mm -hmm. it. Uh, the radio single flopped and didn't do anything. Uh, it got a bunch of nominations from people who liked it. And then he won a bunch and then he went on, 
the CMA Awards and performed with Justin Timberlake and everybody just sort of lost their dang minds. Yeah. So question to that would be, do you think he wouldn't have done as well or become, you know, the sensation that he was from that performance if he hadn't done that pairing with Justin Timberlake? For sure. Yeah. I, I don't mm-hmm. think there's any way you could say otherwise. I mean, maybe he would have found something else similar down the line. Um, but he's kind of this humble guy. Like he's not a self promoter. So I, I couldn't have seen him like going out there to sort of find like these big grandiose gestures or doing something that's going to go viral. Yeah. Like he called up Justin Timberlake cause he was friends with Justin Timberlake hmm. and got him to perform. And of course the CMAs loved that because JT at the CMA awards is a really big thing. And like, they just, you know, I, we did a, a separate secret history video on this. If you go back and watch that performance, that performance is all about Justin Timberlake. Like Chris yes. <laughs> for the first half of it is kind of hanging on, but like yeah. it's, that's JT's moment. But Chris Stapleton was like the big, and I, I, that's not really to kind of tarnish Stapleton's contribution, but right. Like, that was that was that was a that was a Timberlake moment. He's eligible for the Country Music Hall of Fame, and I would love for you to kind of just dive in a little bit more because I think for me, when I and yes, I understand that he's had such a you know he's had a shorter career as an artist than he's had as a songwriter. Um, and I, I think for me, though, when I think of like Shania Twain, who's not in the Country Music Hall of Fame yet, you know, and some other, I'd say equally big in their own right artists aren't in the country music hall of fame, but have been in the industry longer, but he is eligible. Why? So I'm going to try to quickly and neatly explain the eligibility process for the hall of fame. Okay. Like the timetable is 20 years, like 20 years from reaching national prominence. And for the sake of our video, we used Brad Paisley's song, that song from his mud on the tires album as like the start. He might've had a few cuts prior to that, but not many. So 2003. So he'd be eligible in like July of 2023 as a songwriter. So that's his songwriter eligibility period. My argument is that like, as a songwriter, he's hall of fame worthy and hall of fame worthy soon. They only induct songwriters every three years. So maybe, um, I think they're inducting a songwriter in 2023. Maybe he'd be up for it as a songwriter in 2026 or 2029, certainly. But because he started this artist, having this artist success and reached national prominence there, that almost kind of reset the clock for him because people don't consider him in the songwriter category because I think it's probably by now pretty clear he's going to get as an artist. Hmm. So you got to think when was the CMA moment? That was 2015. That pushes his eligibility to like 2035 when really like, you know, as a songwriter, he might have got in a good 10 years earlier, but because of his success, he's probably going to get into the Hall of Fame later than he might have otherwise, if that makes sense. Is there a too soon to be inducted into the Country Music Hall of Fame? Like, does it, would it stunt your career at any, in any way of, I, I to me, when I think of the Country Music Hall of Fame, I think of like, you're kind of at the end of your career, right. you know? Yes. I have always wondered that question. Like, really? Yeah. I mean, I think of artists like Kenny Chesney, who yeah. is Hall of Fame eligible and has been for well over 10 years. Hmm. Like, does he want to be considered a, a country music Hall of Famer? Because I think when you're a Hall of Famer, that's sort of an associated with like maybe retired or getting old. Yeah. And he's still very active and playing these biggest stages. Like maybe that's a sort of moniker or, or like a description he's not ready to put around his neck quite yet. Um, yeah. I don't know that anybody's talking about putting Kenny Chesney in. I mean, he certainly should go in fairly quickly. I'll tell you who's going to be an interesting artist uh, when she becomes eligible here shortly is Taylor Swift, because she's eligible in 2026, I believe. And I think there's maybe a little bit of buzz that she might get in like first or second or third ballot. And in that sense, I think that like if I were her, I would like that one would be an okay in the sense of like, She's no, like, she's pop. So she's not right. in country anymore. So I kind of feel like that one being a little bit of a door closed is like, eh, unless she plans on coming back to country. That mm. I, I kind of agree. It's a different scenario. Yes. Like versus like a Kenny Chesney. Um, I mean, Chris Stapleton, he'll be well past 50. I don't know that he, he projects like the same sort of youthful energy as like a Kenny Chesney or like a Tim McGraw. Okay. So he might be more like a Garth Brooks who was inducted kind of young. Uh, relatively young anyway, who he can kind of continue to thrive as a Hall of Fame member. Like he's not relying on that sort of youthful spirit. 
were there any questions that you had in the the video before this that in our secret history video uh, that you were left with? I would love to know what held him back as being an artist in the early 2000s. Hmm. Like the voice was there. The songwriting was there. Hmm. Like what was the missing piece for him being a solo artist? Because I don't know that he really became a, a solo artist till a, a signed record label until like 2011 or 2012 and released a song called You Should Probably Leave. So like what was the hold back there? Was it he just wasn't ready for it? I'm sorry. The song wasn't. You should, be, should probably leave. It was called, uh, what are you listening to? Um, but like, I'm not sure if he just wasn't ready for it. Maybe he didn't have sort of the, the charisma, but I often wonder if it was like an image thing too. Like he wasn't like, you think about like the early 2000s in country music, it was very frosted tips and sexy. And like, <laughs> that was like a pop country. And then you got Chris Stapleton and he didn't have a beard then, but he was like kind of this Kentucky kid with like not ripped muscles. Like maybe it, that held him back. No, no cut off t shirt. <laughs> no, he wasn't broing it up out there. You know what I mean? Well, I wonder. <laughs> I, I don't know if he's if he's ever uh, spoken about this, but I wonder maybe imposter syndrome a little bit. Maybe. Yeah, perhaps that'd be a good a good question to ask him, like about his frustrations as an artist, if he had them. Um, yeah, coming up because uh, he was successful as a songwriter, but you know how badly did he want that? artist success and to be touring and doing all those sort of things. Um, I don't know if anybody's ever really explored that with him. Hmm. <laughs> uh, a question I do have, and it, if we don't want to tangent too far from the country music hall convo, I won't tangent mm -hmm. there, but if I do have the, the, um, the green light to tangent, I would like to tangent. All right. Go okay. Ahead. Let's hear it. Here's a hot take I have. So at the ACM Awards, this past ACM Awards, there was a picture. John Shear took it. I think he phenomenal photographer, really like his photography. And it was a picture of, so uh, Chris Stapleton, well, you know where I'm going, one entertainer yeah. of the year. And after it's this black and white image of Chris with a leaf blower blowing all the confetti away. It's essentially everyone's gone and he's staying essentially being the cleanup crew. Yeah. I think this is my hot take. I think that fo this is another, I've never met Chris in my life. I'm, have no doubt he's a, a nice, nice man. But do we think that was staged? Like, really? Is Chris Stane going, <laughs> how can I help? Like, pick up the chairs, like, after church, you know? Like, it was he really doing that? <laughs> Maybe staged in, like, a, wouldn't this be kind of funny, ha-ha kind yes. of way? Like, yes. Like, yeah. I would <laughs> Not love to hey, the like, story Hold on, photo. John. Like, like, come get me doing this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah right, <laughs> More right, <playful>. right. <laughs> Yeah, more, maybe in that sort of a sense, just kind of recognizing sort of the yin and yang of the moment. Like maybe yeah. I, I emailed, I reached out to John after that. And I never got a response. I'm going to have to pin him down at that at some point because he, he's been a friend to Taste of Country for a mm -hmm. while. Like how did this, if, I mean, I'm I, like, where did they get the leaf blower from? First of all, like <laughs> <laughs> who brought that to the ACMs? Yeah, I love that. I, I, I want to know the answer to that as well. That's fun.